Yeah, that's it. Cool. So we're down here at Wildways, having had a meeting for the last couple of days to talk about BDO and where it's going. And it's for me, it's I guess it's the first chance I've actually had to sit down and hear from you, kind of your journey that led you into Druidry and kind of how it's evolved for you as a person. We, we talk about BDO, but never necessarily always about the individual people behind it. So, um, so yeah, Philip, I'm just what led you to that? What led you to Druidry, actually, is, is, is probably the first. I'm sorry, it's a pleasure to run into someone who hasn't heard all these stories 20 well, times already. Yeah, yeah, no, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. It's, it's, oh, dear. Um, yeah, I mean, I discovered Druidry in 1974, and it was the result of, um, well, I mean, basically, as I always say, it was the result of having been a weird kid. Mm -hmm. Um because I was pretty strange as a child by I think most people's standards um, I always related better to animals mm -hmm. uh, than I did to humans um, assisted by the fact that my mother kept a, a, when I was a child <laughs> 13 cats was the maximum we got up to and more than half of those were pretty feral oh okay <laughs> um, so like when I was quite little, I used to sneak out of the house in the middle of the night and go over the fields with the, the cats and hang out with them, um, sort of sneak out after everybody else had gone to sleep. And I felt really comfortable doing that, whereas I never really felt very comfortable in company with humans, okay, including yeah, yeah. members of my family. Yeah, yeah. And part of the reason for that was because I always had very weird dreams. Mm -hmm. um, repeating nightmares that were sort of deeply surreal and disturbing and also waking visions and whenever I tried to speak to members of my family or anybody else about this the automatic response was don't talk about that because people will think you're crazy and you'll get locked up yeah, yeah. so you then suppress it you don't talk to anyone no. about it but when these things are still going on in your head I mean, I found that there was a really pressing need, from my point of view, to figure out why and what they what were about. about and, yeah, yeah. So that was why I began a spiritual quest at quite an early age, once I sort of vaguely understood that there might be such a thing. Because mm -hmm. um, I was brought up as an atheist. My parents were scientific rationalists. Right. My father was a member of the Communist Party before the war. Yeah. Um, uh, just a Stalinist and complete scientific rationalism yeah, all yeah. there is when yeah. you're dead you're dead that's it that's you know it. all this yeah. kind of thing spirituality was uh, how to oppress the masses um, or the domain of idiots as as far as my parents were concerned particularly my father so there was no room for what was happening to me in that conversation there was no conversation no no it's a complete dead wall isn't it? it's just <laughs> not going anywhere <laughs> but because I knew that there was you know more to life than is in your philosophy <laughs> I really wanted to know what that was and I didn't know how to go about finding it and I um, in the 60s uh, which was when I hit my teens um, of course the whole thing was like looking to eastern philosophies yeah. like uh, Zen Buddhism mm -hmm. which I discovered through um, the work of Jack Kerouac actually <laughs> um, and then there was the whole sort of Hinduism thing which was going on, particularly with my great idol yeah. at the time, George Harrison. Of course, yeah. Just a beautiful guy who yeah. made the most wonderful music and was deeply influenced by his friendship with Ravi Shankar. Yeah. And so there was the whole like Hare Krishna thing because mm -hmm. he was supporting them and, and paying to put out their records. Yeah. And there was the great sort of hit that had everyone in the country chanting Hare Krishna for a couple <laughs> of months. And, and so there was the sort of Hinduism angle as well and uh, of course Hinduism being sort of deeply polythe polytheistic but having in some instances some monotheistic elements to it but it was really interesting and colourful yeah. um, so there was a real like, attraction with that but something never quite gelled and I wasn't old enough at the time to realise that what wasn't gelling was that these things were just not in my cultural background yeah um, and there were aspects of them that I could understand and there were aspects of them that I could really deeply appreciate but at the same time I didn't have the sort of background knowledge that growing up with them gives you. Like a language. 
yeah. if your second languages are never yeah. as understood as well as your first, is it? And then, like, because all the strangeness that was going on, I ended up having like a complete mental breakdown when I was 18. And it was three years after that, I was still in a process of recovery. Mm -hmm. And I came across a copy of uh, Robert Graves' The White Goddess, which I still maintain is one of the most extraordinary and weird books that the 20th century produced. <laughs> it's, I'm, I've read it cover to cover seven times now, and every time I've read it, it's been a completely different book, and nothing like the one that I remembered that from remember previous reading. readings, yeah. <laughs> which in itself is quite peculiar. I mean, as, as a factual historical guide to Celtic traditions, it's worse than useless. <laughs> it's <laughs> deeply, deeply misleading. <laughs> but that was never the point of it. His point was that he wanted to talk about um, poetic inspiration yeah. as personified um, in the actual women who he uh, referred to knowingly as his muses, mm -hmm. and then working back from that to the concept of the muses in Greek mythology... And then because of his own cultural background, he was looking for the goddess in um, native British tradition. Yes, yeah. And it was that aspect of it that drew me in because he was he led me to go and find a copy of the Mabinogion in a second-hand bookshop, this great compendium of Welsh folklore and legend. And I started reading these stories about the gods of our own lands who were moving through landscapes that I recognised. Yes. That was what immediately hit me, one of the first things that hit me. Because although being brought up an atheist, I went to Church of England schools. Right. So I had a certain amount of um, knowledge of Christianity from that. And, of course, all of the stories in the Bible involve, like, palm trees and camels and... Don't get too many of those around here. Stuff like <laughs> that. Even in Sussex, no, you no. didn't get all that many. <laughs> It, with the one exception of the time when they were making the film Carry On, Follow That Camel, oh, right. <laughs> which was made in the village that I lived in, because oh, <laughs> there were like big sand dunes yes, there, yeah, which they yeah. used as the desert, yeah. and they built a, a, the, the fort that's in the was film was there, actually was on it? top of the sand dunes, <laughs> and um, we used to go over there because it was like quite a fun thing, yeah, and, yeah. and there were like Kenneth Williams sort of filming Thank bits you. and things and all these <laughs> other folks most of whom were quite entertaining to chat to yeah. in between takes. Yeah. And, um, it was just good fun for a kid. And they did actually bring camels. And <laughs> and they, we had a camel crossing on, okay. on the sand dunes. <laughs> and they brought in palm trees. They brought in truckloads oh. of palm trees and planted them all over the bit. But other than that... Yeah, no. other than that. <laughs> <laughs> they weren't really something that you recognised from like everyday life in no, Britain. no. You know? Whereas the stories in the Mabinogion, instead of palm trees, there are oak trees. Yeah. And instead of camels, there are, you know, like mice and, and cattle and sheep and goats. And yeah. the kind of animals, I mean, I, it was a rural community where I lived. It was a sheep farm right next door. Yeah. So it was just that recognition of landscape, I think, really, was the first thing that triggered the thought that, OK, this is actually a native spirituality yeah. Yeah. <laughs> in the land that I was born in. Um, and my ancestry, because my father was interested in genealogy, so I knew that my ancestry went back a long way and that most of it was based in the British Isles. Okay, yeah. Um, and there was just something about that that attracted me. And then, I say, reading the Mabinogion, realising that there were these gods that were embedded in our landscape, grew out of our landscape. And that led me to Druidry. And so... By the end of that year, it was like the, in the summer of 1974 when I read The White Goddess, by the end of that year, in fact by the end of the book, <laughs> <laughs> I'd come to the conclusion that I should be a druid. Yeah. So then of course the obvious question is, well, yeah. how do I do how that do then? Do that? <laughs> <laughs> Did you get, was it, was it like that kind of, because I know lots of people when they discover druidry, I mean it's probably not just druidry, but certainly within druidry you get that kind of coming home feel and I, I know for me like c 
connecting back here with you guys, there's that sense of returning home again. Was, was did you did you get that kind of feeling at that time, or or was that? Yeah. Like a, it, well, I mean, it was a sense of recognition mm -hmm. that that this was somewhere I could fit. Yes. Yeah. Um. And I mean, could, I, like I didn't know any druid groups at the time. The only one I knew existed was the lot who used to get their pictures in the papers every year because of doing the Stonehenge yes. summer solstice yeah. ceremony. Yeah. They were the only ones that I knew existed, okay. and they didn't look like a lot of fun. No. <laughs> um, they were all wearing these like pristine white robes, and if you look carefully at the photographs, you could see they were all wearing like really smart business suits underneath. <laughs> And of course, I was a like authentic nineteen sixty seven hippie, so yes, so they just, just didn't look didn't like quite my kind appeal. of people. No, no, <laughs> can't imagine. What. But it was, I mean, it was the druidry that I found in um, Robert Graves, mm -hmm. and then in Mabinogi, and and then to a lesser extent in like Stuart Pigott's book on the archaeology of druidry, mm -hmm. which the Druids, which was the yes. only book available on druids at the time. Um, but I. From some alchemical combination of those, I developed, or there developed inside me, my own image of a druid. Yeah. And it wasn't these people, mostly guys, at Stonehenge in the white robes. It was something that was much earthier than that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, again, it comes back to this notion that the gods were connected with the land. Yeah the gods and the land were what druidry was about. So I, th I saw my image of a druid more as um, someone in green and brown to blend in with the forest, yeah. I guess is the one way to put it, and to be a part of yeah. the landscape and really deeply spiritually, True. fundamentally connected with it. Yeah. And Kind of part of those stories that are already tied into the land. Yeah, I mean that. Ultimately, it was that idea and the fact that I couldn't find a druid group that existed already um, that led me to the idea of putting one together. Because mm -hmm. um, I say, like, there was that question: What do you do now that you've decided you're a <laughs> druid? And I mean, it's still a question. I'm sure that pe that comes to people now: What do you do? Yeah. Now, at least, there are like courses and books yes, and indeed. places online yeah. there's stuff that you can do yeah. in 1974 yeah, there was, was nothing no, no, <laughs> zilch zero <laughs> as far blank, as I could see canvas. so I kind of left my own devices and I mean one of the things that I, I read um, in Stuart Piggott's book was this idea of druids wearing white robes because mm -hmm. he wrote about the druid revivals that started yes, in the 18th yeah. century and they had this idea that druids should wear white robes. So the first thing I did to become a druid was to go and go buy and a, a white robe. robe. <laughs> <laughs> Kensington Market. <laughs> they had a lot of them imported from Morocco. Brilliant. So I got myself a nice uh, white cotton robe and uh, I had a pair of sandals and <laughs> um, I was like already growing a beard by that time, yeah. I think. So, and I had the long hair from the hippie days and uh, so I would walk around um, Hastings and St. Leonard's uh, wearing my robe because I thought if I put on the robe, see, then I'll like look like a druid. Okay, yeah. That will help me to feel the like a druid and that will help me to be a yeah, druid. Yeah, yeah, no, I can see that. <laughs> it was the only <laughs> handle I'd really yeah, got. Yeah. <laughs> so, of course, I'm walking around like Hastings and St. Leonard's and what you get is like a bunch of sort of skinheads. Who do you think you are then? Jesus! Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> I got a yeah. fair bit of that, um, just sort of put up with it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then, oh dear, what happened, happened? Yeah, I mean, the next kind of phase after that was a little bit later. Um, I started running uh, what we used to call an occult bookshop, mm -hmm. um, type, you know, new age yeah, store, yeah, yeah. whatever. <laughs> and I started running one of those in St. Leonard's. And uh, even before then, actually, I'd been approached by a guy who was a member of Alexander's Coven. Right. Because Alex had lived in London, but he'd moved down to the south coast. Yeah. And he was living for a while in St. Leonard's. And there was a guy I'd been to school with 
who approached me in a disco mm -hmm. and tried to get me to join, tried to persuade me to join Alex's coven, oh, okay. which he'd just yeah. done. Yeah. And I had kind of had this, a problem with the whole idea of gurus. And from what I'd seen of Alex, it looked as though he was that in that sort of ballpark. Kind, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that kind of put me off. So I kind of turned it down. And I had um, two subsequent approaches after that. One of which was after I'd started running this occult bookshop, mm -hmm. um, Solstice in St. Leonard's. And... Uh, Again, it was like a member of Alex's coven came and tried to sort of convince me that I should join it. And again, I said, eh, well, no, not really. Yeah. But then a friend of mine did join, and he went through all three stages of um, Alexandrian Wiccan training mm -hmm. until he got to be a high priest in Alex's coven, yeah. at which point you hive off and you form a coven of yes, your own. Yeah. So because like he'd been a regular at the bookshop and I'd got to know him quite well, and nice guy. And he came and asked me if I wanted to join the coven. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, I know this guy, I know he's all right. Yes, <laughs> yeah, I'm not, I'm not. So um, I did, I joined the coven and um, it was an interesting way to run a coven because he had got the Book of Shadows that he had got from Alex which he had copied out in his own hand of yeah, light, yeah. as of course you had to had do. To do. Still do. <laughs> and the first thing that we did um, before we formed the rest of the coven even, he wanted um, to initiate me and he actually asked me to sit down with him and work out my own initiation ceremony. That's which is an unusual weird. approach. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, most people don't do that. No. You take the book of shadows, you go with it. Yeah, but he, for some reason, said no. Let's do it this way. Mm -hmm. So we did. We sat down, and I had like quite a good collection of books already by that time, and I'd been sort of mulling around ideas as to how to do ceremony. Right. So we did. We put together my initiation ceremony, but there was one thing that we kept from Alex okay. because Alex had this thing when someone hived off from the group to form their own group mm -hmm. um, he would give them deities to work with a male and a female deity to work with yeah. and in our case it was Keridwen mm -hmm. for the female <laughs> the goddess <laughs> um, and Kenunos yeah. for the god right both of whom I already knew, of course. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> so Kenunos, the antlered god, right? I could really get behind that. Yeah, Great, yeah. because he kind of blended really nicely with my image of what a druid was. Yeah. And Keridwen, I already knew from the story of Keridwen Taliesin of course. as the brewer of the cauldron yeah. of inspiration. And <laughs> um, uh, Robert Graves is like ultimate muse goddess, yeah. basically. Yeah. So we had this pair that Alex had given um, to Gary to be our formative duo, and they were perfect. Yeah. Absolutely perfect way. for me. <laughs> so, of course, the upshot of this is I join, we join a bunch of other people, and uh, we have a coven. Um, the one thing that Gary didn't get from Alex was an awful lot of information about how to run seasonal festivals. Oh, okay. We had the full like Sabbath, right? Yeah. But we didn't have um, seasonal aspects to go with seasonal celebrations, right? Other than a very, very bare skeletal outline. So Gary, because he knew that I had a really good library, <laughs> asked me to put together the seasonal celebrations, the eight s seasonal festivals. Yeah. So I produced a cycle of seasonal festivals for us to do in the coven all based on stories from the Mabinogion. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say was whether, whether, that was in, whether you worked from whatever little bits you were given or whether you were just complete free to evolve that yourself. Pretty much. The, I mean, there was like a sort of... Uh, we kept like a vaguely similar structure because there's this thing about um, the goddess going down into the underworld mm -hmm. um, at the beginning of winter and then coming back up with the spring. Yep. And that fortunately is paralleled in stories in the Mabinogion yeah. <laughs> so um, I basically we took the cycle of um, 
Flaithlau Giffes, the young sun god, who uh, in the springtime marries the goddess of the emerging plant life, um, Blood Eye with the, fl the flower yes, maiden. Yeah. And I built this um, whole mythical ritual ceremonial cycle that went round the year based on the legend of those two. Wonderful. And with the death of Flaithlau Giffes when he transforms, his spirit transforms into an eagle and uh, the, the magician god Gwydion goes out into the forest to find him and his eagle form is up in the top of an oak tree and he sings the song that enchants him down from the oak tree at midwinter mm -hmm. and it sort of parallels with the cutting of the mistletoe from the oak tree yes, and yeah. so all this stuff is yes. like incredibly druidic yeah, right? completely, completely. <laughs> and we're building it into our um, Alexandrian Wiccan coven <laughs> so having got to the end of this seasonal cycle for the first time round we had one of our monthly get-togethers of, of the coven and we all sat down and somebody I can't remember who it was said you know we've changed so much in the book of shadows now and we've added so much to it because we'd also been revising the rest of the book of okay shadows. yeah and because I'd been involved in it all those revisions were basically okay, making it more Celtic <laughs> <laughs> it's and I say funny. somebody said we should you know should we stop calling ourselves a coven and maybe call ourselves something else. Yeah. Um, and we all sort of sat and thought about it and thought, well, yeah, there's probably some sense to that, but what do we call ourselves? So we batted around a bunch of ideas. And somebody, again, I can't remember who, said, how about if we call ourselves a grove? And everybody just went, yeah, that's good. <laughs> that fits. <laughs> and at the time, we hadn't a clue that grove was a designation commonly used by other druid groups. We had no idea Just of this. Completely separate from and yeah, wow. yeah. <laughs> so we called ourselves the Grove of the Badger because there was a wood near us, yeah. near where we used to meet every month. Um, that some of us used to go and sit in, like, and sometimes do all nighters just to watch the badgers, yeah. basically, because they're extraordinary, weird, wild, me. lovely yeah. animals. <laughs> I mean, on one occasion I saw like a mother badger with um, four little ones coming along behind them oh, and yeah. walked past a path about two feet away from me because I'd been sitting quietly for about an hour yeah, yeah. and they just like I wasn't there anymore yeah. Um, so yeah we became the grove of the badger and then um, when the grove um, uh, s split up because people were pursuing careers that were taking them to other parts of the country and um, for whatever reason we weren't able to replace them so the numbers were sort of reducing and uh, it got to a point where I was sort of wondering what was going on and if this was indeed the right path that I was supposed to be on yeah. so this was like <laughs> one of those key moments in my entire career at the time I was living in a flat that had a balcony out the back so one night when I'd been having these concerns about sort of my uh, basically a spiritual crisis yes yeah so I went out onto the balcony one night and I stood there looking up at the sky and I said if this is the path I am supposed to be on show me a sign let that sign be a shooting star and let it appear now and I pointed up into the sky <laughs> And of course, at the point yeah. where I was pointing, yeah. a really bright oh, shooting geez, star so shot across the sky. <laughs> I mean, yeah. the chances of that happening must be like billions. Yeah, to just one. ridiculously. <laughs> so at that point, I just said, um, "All right, okay. <laughs> thank you," <Yeah>. okay. <laughs> and thought, "Right, I'll stick with it." But I mean, I didn't really know what to do, mm. and the thing kind of eventually came to an end. Um, Gary himself eventually moved away and uh, I was left with all this material a lot of which I'd written mm -hmm. and um, sort of kicked it around a bit and revised it a bit and sort of occasionally asked other people to try out ceremonies with me yeah. so a couple of us would sort of go down to the woods and do something that I thought might work and have a relevance um, and then 
Yeah, because of running the occult shop, we were developing contacts because we were running a mail order thing from it. And I put out a message with the, the mailings that we used to send out asking if people would be interested in forming a new druid group. Mm -hmm. And of course, people are inherently lazy, so very few people responded because it sounded like a yeah. lot of work. <laughs> what they wanted was a group that already existed if they were going to join one yeah. at all, yeah. not to sort of create one. So, yeah, sort of batted it around for a bit, did ceremonies with just like one or two people here and there, um, initiated a few people, um, and just kind of worked at it quietly for quite some time. Um, until, <laughs> oddly enough, along came Margaret Thatcher and the poll tax. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this may seem a little left field. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Bear with me. <laughs> so the poll tax is a thing, right? Everybody hates it because it's grossly, grossly unfair. Yeah. So there are huge rebellions against it up and down the country, taking a variety of forms. I discovered that one of the, the, the things in the poll tax legislation was that if you were registered as a religious house, mm -hmm. you didn't have to pay the poll tax. So this like, obviously applies yeah. to like, nunneries, monasteries, yeah. what have you. you know. But I thought, well, you know, I've got this druid group <laughs> <laughs> and I've got a house. So if I'm running a druid group from a house, That's that makes it a religious house. Right? Yeah. So I uh, wrote to the relevant authorities and said, look, you know, mine is a religious house, the religion being druidry. And of course, the response I got back from them was druidry is not a religion. Yeah. <laughs> so I thought, well, maybe if I sort of produce some printed material that I can send to them, mm -hmm. uh, that would be enough to prove to them that Druidry is a religion. Because yeah. it had been my religion for quite a few years already. <laughs> so I did. I started putting together the Grove material um, into booklets and uh, printing them up on like friends who gave me access to printing machines yeah. that they had access to at work or college or whatever. I printed up these booklets and I sent them to the poll tax people and said, look, you know, this is what we do. This is sort of how the thing operates. So it was actually the poll tax that, that made, made me start producing gave that drive to <laughs> <laughs> booklets for the British Druid Order. So we've got the poll tax to thank for that extra drive to pulling it all together and actually putting something out there. Weirdly so. Yeah, yeah. 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 That's... yeah. <laughs> and then, like, because I got these booklets, right, I thought, well, what do I do with them now? So I started sort of offering them to people and sort mm -hmm. of sending them out to people and um, we started to develop a broader membership right. beyond yeah. people I actually personally knew. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so we had the beginnings of a mail order course. But then it became um, so difficult to keep up a schedule of printing uh, and sending them out and it involved so much office work that I kind of stopped after about the first six months worth of booklets, I think. Uh, yeah, because people don't always understand the amount of time that goes into no, running and pulling packaging. stuff together. and yeah. I mean, I, I met um, Philip and Stephanie Cargom um, around that time, and uh, that was like really early in the days of him um, refounding yeah. Obod. And they were already having to employ two full-time secretaries yeah. to cope with the amount of office work that their courses were generating. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's it's a it's a difficult thing to put together and a difficult thing to run, especially if you're doing it in print. Yes. Because there's a, an awful lot of admin involved in that. So, so I kind of knocked it on the head for a bit, and the next. Um, big thing that came along with uh, the BDO was being asked to do a ceremony in Avebury for a multi-faith conference. What? Yeah. Um, so, uh, so when I met Philip and Stephanie, um, 
I mean, first thing, they were just really nice people. Indeed. And we quickly became friends because we were about the same age. Mm -hmm. We had kids who were about the same age, yep. their girls, my boys. And um, they only lived 20 miles away in Lewis. So we became like frequent yep. flyers and, and friends and yep. sit around in kitchens <laughs> discussing the state of the world as you do. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and. Um, yeah, good folks. And they uh, invited us to um, ceremonies that they were doing over in Lewis. Mm -hmm. And uh, they also helped out with some of the printing because they had a printing machine, obviously, because yep. they were doing their um, courses as print. And uh, Philip suggested that because I'd got my own Druid group, mm -hmm. I should join a thing called the Council of British Druid Orders. Yes. So I quite quickly went from knowing only the Druids that I'd initiated myself to knowing a whole network of different wow. Druid groups yeah, yeah, all over the country. <laughs> <laughs> um, which was interesting. Um, one of the first things happened after I got in touch with the Council of British Druid Orders and went to my first meeting with them. Um, was I became the first druid to have a stall at a pagan federation conference. Um, <laughs> and that was interesting in itself because standing behind the stall and like we put this magazine together, mm -hmm. the, the Druid's Voice yeah. that I was editing. So we had copies of the Druid's Voice and we had bits of literature about the various druid groups yeah. that were around. So I'm at this stall at the, the Pagan Federation National Conference in London most of the people who came up to the stall said, what are you doing here? There aren't any pagan druids. <laughs> well, <laughs> to which I said, well, there's at least one and here I am. You know? <laughs> but there was this like widespread misunderstanding that came from the, the druid revivals of the 18th century, yeah. which is that druids were basically um, Christians in white robes. Yeah, yeah. Um, like biblical patriarchs, the whole sort of, you know, white bearded, white That's robe it. job. Yeah. And uh, a lot of the 18th century Druid revivalists were actually um, Christian clerics. Um, and they promoted the idea that the role of Druids in ancient society had been to prepare us for the coming of Christ. Okay, yeah. This was like a big thing with them. Yeah. And it kind of stuck in the consciousness, I say, to the extent that fellow pagans had no idea yeah, that there, there was, was such, such a thing, a thing as, as pagan well. druidry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just take it for accepted now, don't you, Burton? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then I say the, the opportunity came up to put together a, a ceremony for this multi-faith conference in Avebury, which was hosted by one of the druids I'd met through the Council of British Druid Orders, who's a guy who's no longer with us, sadly, called Tim Sebastian. Mm -hmm. um, uh, wonderfully funny man <laughs> in many ways a uh, great sense of humor um, hence his group was called the secular order of druids um, which knowingly <laughs> shortens to yes, sod yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and he used to frequently refer to himself as the old sod <laughs> <laughs> but tim was a, a a great guy a very interesting man um and he, this was one of a series of multi-faith conferences that he'd been putting together for a few years at that point. And this one was the first one, I think, to be held in Avebury. Mm -hmm. And from talking to him, he knew how much I loved Avebury. Because yeah. I first visited there in the 1970s and just immediately fallen completely in love with the place. Just the whole enchantment of it. It felt to me the first time I went there like... a. Um, I was being welcomed into the open arms of a great earth goddess. It was an extraordinary sensation, a beautiful, an beautiful thing. Yeah. Um, so Tim asked me to put together a ceremony that all of these different um, groups coming together for this multi-faith conference could all take part in mm -hmm. um, on the Sunday of the weekend of the conference. And it was a really diverse group. There were Reichian therapists who came along with an orgon accumulator uh, <laughs> there were scientists from the Royal Observatory. Right. Um, there were. Uh, Ronald Hutton was talking about shamanism. Um, uh, 
Oh, yes. Um, John Michel, who wrote The View Over Atlantis, mm -hmm. he was there, um, again, as one of the speakers. And uh, so there were Earth Mysteries folk, there were ufologists, um, just a range of uh, and, oh, Christian ministers yeah. as well, of course. And uh, you know, a couple of monks and this, that, and the other, and so, so it was a <laughs> really diverse a group. And a half. <laughs> so I was sort of aware of that, um, but I wanted to build a ceremony that would that would really honour this place, Avebury, this amazingly magical place. So I steeped myself in as much information about Avebury itself as I could find, mm -hmm. and I wrote aspects of what I found in the archaeology of the place into the ceremony. Yeah to try and sort of blend it with the spirits of the place as much as I could. And the ceremony itself was remarkable in many ways, not least of which is there was a couple called um, Gary and Debbie who were members of the British Druid Order. Mm -hmm. And they had asked for a bardic initiation. Right. And knowing that I was preparing this ceremony for this weekend in Avebury, I thought, wow, Avebury, now wouldn't that be a great place to have a bardic initiation? If you're going to do it, that's, that's <laughs> gonna, it's going to be up there, hasn't it? <laughs> so I, I put it to them, I said, you know, would that be okay with you if you did your bardic initiation at Avebury? And oh, yeah, absolutely. So we rented a cottage together, sort of my family and their family, and uh, we took our kids mm -hmm. along, and we had this rented cottage just up the road from Avebury. Um, and we got to the moment in the ceremony where I'd written in their bardic initiation. I'm standing next to Philip Cargon, who's mm -hmm. just um, uh, helped out with the hand fasting of myself and my wife. Yeah. Um, and I say, would those who wish to be initiated as bards of the Gorseth of Kaya Arbury, mm -hmm. which was a name I'd made up specially for the event, yeah, yeah. to step forward into the circle? expecting Gary and Debbie. Yeah, just there. Uh... There was a pause and nobody stepped forward. <laughs> right? oh. And I thought, what's going to happen here? Are we going <laughs> to just have to move on to the next thing? And then just before Gary and Debbie stepped forward, four other people did. Wonderful. And then Gary and Debbie themselves, and then a bunch of other people thought, all right then. <laughs> <So> <laughs> And we ended up with about two thirds of the people in the circle had stepped forward to be initiated as bards. That's amazing. <laughs> At which point, Philip, bless him, leaned over towards me and said, "What do we do now?" In a sort of theatrical whisper. <laughs> and I said, "Well, we go ahead, I suppose." Go with the moment, yeah, completely. <laughs> so we did. We did this bardic initiation that I'd written just for Gary and Debbie, but we did it for like all of these other people in the circle. And the feeling generated by doing it was extraordinary. Yeah. It was like nothing else I'd quite ever experienced in ceremony. So after the whole ceremony was finished, the first thing that happened was um, two elderly um, church ministers, one from the Church of England, mm -hmm. one from the Church of Scotland, came up to me and were the first people to say, wonderful ceremony, thank you Fabulous. so much, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which I thought was really nice. Yeah. Um, and after that, like, everybody retired to um, a lawn um, at the back of the barn in Avebury, and we were all sitting out in the sunshine talking about what had just happened, mm -hmm. and everybody was really buzzing from it, and yeah, I yeah. thought, well, this was like really good. Maybe we should do it again. So I had a notebook and a pen, and I went round and asked everybody if they wanted to do it again. Mm -hmm. And everybody, oh yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And they were all really eager to put down their names yeah, and addresses. Yeah. And so um, I went home and put together a newsletter and sent it out. And we found that we had created this thing called the Gorset of Bards <laughs> of Kyrabbery. <laughs> and within a couple of years, um, we'd had like thousands of people who'd been initiated into it and we had on the, the, I'm fairly sure it was on the second anniversary um, we had over a thousand people in the circle <laughs> wow that's how, yeah having run public stuff for a thousand people is phenomenal <laughs> well Ronald Hutton who was at the first one um, he wrote about it and he referred to it as the central event of the new Druidry yeah um, in one of the books that he put out and uh Ronald, 
oh yeah, must say Ronald at that first one. Mm -hmm. um, he hadn't been told in advance that there was going to be a ceremony, okay. and he was incredibly apologetic mm -hmm. about this. And it's, I'm terribly sorry. I haven't brought my druid robes. <laughs> I'm really, really sorry. I, I have got some ceremonial equipment with me. Uh, but it, it's, it's in the car. Is it all right if I go back to the car park and? and, and I, it's, it's, yeah, it's really no yeah, problem, you know, yeah, turn just, up as you are, yeah, it really doesn't yeah. matter. So he goes off, right, and the rest of us sort of start doing this perambulation round the um, outer bank of the circle, mm -hmm. while another group waits for us at the southern entrance yeah. to, to greet us and welcome us in. So as we're making our way round the last bit of the um, outer bank, there, just down from the bank, um, it, partly in the ditch, we see Ronald. <laughs> Ronald was quite right. He did not have his druid robe mm. with him, but because his talk was about shamanism, he had a Siberian shaman costume that he was wearing. <laughs> ah, wonderful. And as we got closer to him, he, he was standing there in this Siberian shaman costume, and I've seldom seen him look so happy. <laughs> his great <laughs> beaming grin. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just a gorgeous thing to see before we started the actual yeah. ceremony itself. It was wonderful. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, because the Gorseth became such a thing so quickly, the reason being, I don't think anyone in the UK had previously offered what was essentially a pagan ceremony in the open, in public, yes. that anyone could attend. Yeah. And that was the thing. And it was also multi-faith. Yeah. So we did have, like, Baha'i, yeah. Um, Australian Aboriginals, um, Shinto folk from Japan. Um, we had people flying over from the States. Um, we had people... It, <laughs> word spread so quickly that this thing was going on. We had heathens, Wiccans, lots of dream yeah. groups. Yeah. Just a, a wonderful sort of multiplicity of faiths. And there's something about a whole load of spiritual seekers from a lot of different traditions, all coming together, sharing sacred space. Yes. Yeah, definitely. It's amazing because we spend such a lot of time focusing on differences. Yeah, but when you're in that space, you you you, you see that there's a language almost beneath beneath yeah. our own that is is universal, isn't it? It just yeah, you can hear that spirit speaking through all of us. It's and we had this piece of ritual that we'd um, borrowed from the ancient druid order who um, started using it in the 1950s mm -hmm. and it's where everybody in the circle joins hands and we swear this thing called the oath of peace mm -hmm. which is we swear by peace and love to stand heart to heart and hand in hand mark o spirits and hear us now confirming this our sacred vow you say that three times and because of the way it's framed anyone from any spiritual tradition can wholeheartedly 100% get, get behind, behind it. it. Yeah. And it's just a beautiful thing. Yeah, no, it's, it's always been one of my favourite parts, actually, of, yeah. of, of ceremony, at least. Yeah. Just that. So, yeah, I, uh, the, because of um, the Gorseth and the way it took off, and then other people started doing them in other parts of the country and then in other parts of the world, mm -hmm. um, the name of the British Druid Order was suddenly out in the community yeah. a heck of a lot more widely than had been before. And we found ourselves with um, a global membership, yeah. um, despite being called the British Druid Order. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe because of, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but um, so, yeah, that was how we got to be a, a sort of known thing, thing. in the wider pagan yeah, community. Yeah. Um, yeah, through doing ceremonies at an amazing place that brought people together. Because, as I say, I've experienced it as this great welcoming arms of the mother. Because it yeah. is, I mean, it's oh, so it's, big, isn't it? Yeah, yeah And it's so the open, time there's so place. much space between the yeah. stones. Yeah. The immediate impression that you get from it just visually is that it must be, surely, for thousands of people coming from a wide area mm -hmm. to get together yeah. to do stuff. Yeah, it's... And that's exactly yeah. what we were doing. Yeah. So it kind of did fit with the um, spirit of the place, yeah. as intended. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's, it's oh, yeah, no, it's a stunning still. 
So we've been looking at the the, the, the journey from from your early days through, and obviously this weekend we've been we've been talking about um, where we're at now and and where we hope BDO is heading in the future. And I guess it, with that we have to kind of say Druidry as as far as it is for BDO as well. So what's your own personal personal vision for Drew Dream BDO moving forward? Well, I mean, a lot of it goes back to um, when it started in 1974, because mm -hmm. one of the things that formulated my vision of a Druid mm -hmm. was the fact that not only was I reading Robert Grazie's The White Goddess, but because it's quite a difficult book to read, yes. <laughs> a lot of people I know haven't managed to get through no, more than no. the first like 20 pages <laughs> or so. <laughs> It's pretty dense and kind of weird. Um, but I was having to take breaks from it. Mm -hmm. And it so happened that at around the same time, I'd got a copy of Mercia Eliard's Shamanism, Archaic Techniques of Ecstasy. Okay, yeah. So I would read a chapter of The White Goddess and then have to stop and digest that, but still wanted to carry on reading something. So I'd switch over and read a chapter of Perfect. Shamanism, <laughs> Archaic Techniques yeah, of Ecstasy. Yeah. And the two came together beautifully because I say, like, the whole reason I got into it in the first place was being a weird kid. And in shamanism, I was reading that one of the signs that you were a shaman in so many different cultures was being a weird, weird kid. kid. Yeah. And they described what that meant. And it was all the stuff that had happened to me. <laughs> So the weird dreams, the going out yeah. alone, the hanging out with animals, um, even things like having a permanently twitchy right leg, which I did. Oh, wow. That was in there as yeah, well. Yeah. And I mean, just little things like that. And I kept going through the, oh, yeah, that happened. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that was me. <laughs> <laughs> so I had this idea that um, through the combination of the two books that um, druids were the equivalent of um, shamans for Siberia. They were the equivalent for the British Isles mm -hmm. and, as it turned out, um, for a large part of northwestern Europe. Yeah. Um, so I was kind of predicated around this idea that Druids were shamanic folk um, and working out sort of what that meant. And that all came together in another... Um, cataclysmic event um, in my personal quest which was a sweat lodge that I did on an Obod camp in 1994 mm -hmm. and it was in that sweat ceremony that I encountered my wolf spirit um, and the wolf spirit became a guide and mentor and allowed me access to other worlds in ways that I had not had previously and showed me the art of shape-shifting. Um, didn't actually give me a lot of choice first time, <laughs> I have to admit. Like, I'm sitting there and I'm sort of um, drumming and um, chanting along, and my wolf spirit appeared in front of me, as he had previously. Mm -hmm. um, but then he backed off away, and I thought, what's happening here? And then he kind of hunkered down, and I knew that he was about to jump. <laughs> And I knew that I, I mean, I couldn't like move to get out of the way. I just had to carry on doing what I was doing. So I carried on and sort of we locked eyes and he bounded at me, jumped and he jumped into the front of my body and came out the back. Mm -hmm. And when he came out the back, my consciousness was in his body and his consciousness was left in mine. Right. So there's a wolf in my body that carries on drumming. Yeah. And I'm in the wolf's body and I'm charging off into the other world. <laughs> Go with it. Yeah. Go with it. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Ride that way. <laughs> Something like that happens. You don't really have that no. much choice. So, yeah, that um, sweat ceremony in 1994 connected me in that way with my wolf spirit and was the key that I'd been looking for for the previous 20 years, mm -hmm. which was that merging of druidry and what people mostly call shamanism mm -hmm. these days but which I now just call druidry yes, yes. <laughs> so that was really key to me and I think 
uh, I've spent what now 12 years um, putting together courses mm -hmm. for the BDO yeah. starting with the basis of what we did way back in the day with the Grove of the Badger but blending in all of the other stuff that I've learned since and the more I've looked into the origins of our tradition and indeed of most other spiritual traditions in the world the more and more convinced I've become that that initial sense was exactly right mm -hmm. that Druids um, were shamanic folk in that they lived in this world and other worlds yes. beyond it yeah. that they brought the two together that they mediated between one and the other on behalf of their tribes and really increasingly as the progression of doing the courses putting them together editing them researching and writing for them as that process has gone on that has come more and more to the fore mm -hmm. and because of my wolf spirit leading me to um, a tribe called the Quileute in the Pacific Northwest who are descended from shape-shifting wolves mm -hmm. and because of um, being invited to join their drum circle and joining ceremonies with them and experiencing their own quest to recover their own traditions yeah. um, that's fed into the process as well and I see the BDO over the years since that ceremony, that first ceremony at Avebury, mm -hmm. much of the process from there on has been about bringing those archaic, otherworldly, animistic aspects back to the fore in Druidry. So it completely abandons pretty much the whole druid revival idea of the 17th century yeah. the whole sort of white bearded white robed stately figures standing around pontificating <laughs> is kind of fading into the backgrounds yeah. Yeah. and almost disappearing and what you have instead is people um, exploring other worlds um, finding um, power within spirit animals and our relationships with them finding power in direct relationships with the spirits of the land the spirits of our ancestors the spirits of the old gods of this land so it's um i mean the whole trip with the bdo really has been like a repaganizing of mm -hmm. druidry yes yeah um because it had ceased to be pagan during the time of the revival yeah over about a 150 year period um, and in the public mind the image of the druid uh, is still quite a lot that revival image of the, the white so, bearded yeah. white robed sage yeah. it's going to take a while to break that down but we're getting to be pretty well placed to have a crack at it <laughs> <laughs> wonderful <laughs> so I see it, yeah I mean I see us moving into the future um, by bringing out the power that is in our links with our ancestry going back into the very remote past mm -hmm. um, but you know the past is a foreign country and we do things differently now um, so I mean there's ample evidence for um, widespread animal sacrifice in the past mm -hmm. it's not something we engage in now because like times and human sensibilities change Completely. so you know there is stuff that we don't do uh, but there's a lot of stuff that was lost for a long long time um, that we are now beginning to do again yeah um, and there's a real hunger for it as well there is I think at the moment yeah um, it's like I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I suppose Druidry for me, it was like there had been a gap in my life, a great big one, mm -hmm. really, really huge gap, something seriously missing. Yeah. And what filled that gap was Druidry. And I think, 
as a society, pretty much, we've developed a gap, certainly in the UK. Very much. Because it's one of the least religious nations on earth, I think. Which, in a way, is okay, because it means that a lot of people are questioning. Yeah. We're no longer willing to accept things as given just because someone tells us it's so. And that's brilliant. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, the whole sort of scientific rationalist approach that I say my father was predicated on can only really get you so far, I think. Um, and it does leave a gap. Yeah. And one of the things about Druidry is it's incredibly broad. There's so much of it to fill gaps in people's lives. So again, I mean, part of what I've always been interested in is the bardic aspect of the tradition because I was born with a love of music yeah. and art and storytelling. And the bardic tradition is all about the arts, storytelling, storytelling music, yeah. poetry. Um, it, it was that that brought me to Druidry. That, that, um, I remember I, uh, you mentioned having kind of that early spiritual crisis and I had a, a similar thing and I almost considered going and starting training to be a vicar. <laughs> and, uh, but, <laughs> I did but, once. Did it? Yeah? <laughs> yeah, I thought it was the only way I could get paid for being a spiritual person. Yes, no, 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 I think that might have been partly my thinking at the time as well. <laughs> um, but it literally was. But and I, was, I was going and spending time with this vicar, and, but, and he, but he was very good. He just allowed me to explore my own thoughts, and I was a week away from going on some retreat or other that he'd set up. And I was like, there's something just... Where where do I find my connection? What is it? And it was story, poetry, music, playing music. It was, yeah. That's that's where I felt that connection. That's where it came alive for me. That's where I felt like I was part of something so much more. And uh, and it does. It's where it fills that. Well, say so for me, like the storytelling aspect was incredibly important because when I first got the notion that I should be a druid. The only three books I could find, one of them was the Mabinogian. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it was um, equally as formative as um, the White Goddess had been mm -hmm. in its way. Um, and I still work with it now, and I still create ceremonies based on what I find in it. Yeah. And I still, um, I mean, you know, there's this thing like pagan. Modern pagans don't have Bibles. Well, I mean, we come pretty bloody close, close. in Druidry yes. with the Mabinogian, yeah. as far yeah. as I'm concerned. <laughs> I mean, you know, the Bible, the Christian Bible, is a collection of stories from the past. It's a collection of stories that has to do with the divine yeah. and how it operates in the world. That is exactly what the Mabinogian what is, is for yeah. Druidry. Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, it's incredibly important to me. So, I mean, there was an immediate connection there. And then, like, when you get onto the Ovate path, um, I, I have at times dabbled with um, divination, mm -hmm. as I suspect most of us have. Because, yeah, yeah. uh, I mean, I did a, a, a phase in ritual magic in the, the early 70s because a girlfriend of mine was given a tarot deck. Um so I started sort of doing divination with the tarot deck. I mean, it was another one of those weird things, right? I mean, stuff like this happens all the time. But my girlfriend, having been given this tarot deck for mm -hmm. Christmas, her parents, when they gave it to her, said, now, we don't mean you to take this seriously. It's just a jokey, uh, uh, entertaining, amusing mm, gift, yes, right? Yeah. <laughs> so we take it up to her room. There's a couple of her girlfriends there. Um, including Hetty. Mm -hmm. right? Hetty is reluctant to draw a card. The rest of us have all been happily drawing a card, and um, Petra's then been going through the booklet and telling us what yeah, it means. Yeah, yeah. Hetty's been sort of sitting, no, no, I don't want to. No, no, I don't. I'll only draw the death card. No, I don't want to. I won't. <laughs> so eventually, like, because everyone else has, and 
Petra eventually talks her into it and Hetty draws a card and of course you know what it is right it's the death card <laughs> so she looks at I knew it I knew it I knew it would happen so uh, Petra says alright draw another one then <laughs> so she sort of puts it back in the deck shuffles the deck again sort of spreads them out fans them out and Hetty draws a card and yes of course it's the oh. death card <laughs> So Petra then says, all right, you shuffle them then. <laughs> so it gives them to Hetty, and Hetty sort of puts the card back in the middle of the deck, shuffles it, shuffles it, really, really yeah, shuffles yeah, it, yeah. really thoroughly, gives the cards back to Petra, Petra fans them out, pulls it third time, yes, it's the death oh. card. <laughs> so at this point I think, maybe there's something in this business. <laughs> maybe this is something I should look into. So that kind of eventually led me into um, ritual magic, which mm-hmm. is another part of my sort of journey into druidry. But the, the divination side of things comes is covered in um, the uh, ovate area of yes, studies yeah. in druidry. And um, things like herbalism and healing are covered in there as well. Um, and then you've got like the teaching aspect, the community involvement mm-hmm. aspect, which comes in with um, the, the druid part of the yeah. path and the the priesthood part of it and the construction of ceremonies and the, and it's just like pretty much every aspect of life is, is. in druidry somewhere yeah. and covered in a way that makes it spiritual yeah. so if you're looking for exactly what i was looking for when i was a kid and um which is a way to live your life in a spiritual way I don't think there's much that can beat yeah. Druidry yeah. for sheer breadth of <laughs> completely, coverage. Completely. Because yeah. anything you do in life can fall under the aegis of Druidry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I think b- before we, 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 we tie this up, when, when you, you said about that, that time, that, that first time you got that kind of image of, of Formed that image of a druid for you. Yeah. When you kind of close your eyes and think about that, is that still the same image that's there? Or exactly. Has, yeah. It's exactly the same. It's still carried forward. Hasn't changed since 1974. No, it's still there. Yeah. I've just like. I. I mean, <laughs> what I've been trying to do ever since I saw that image of a druid in, in my mind in 1974 is essentially to become it become it yeah and like 44 years on yeah I've got closer you got closer. <laughs> that's the best <laughs> that's, that's, that's I've got closer you're closer yeah, that's, that's uh, the best we can all hope for <laughs> <laughs> fabulous well thank you Philip it's been fabulous chatting. thank you Rob and, uh, we'll, uh, it's yeah. been a blast <laughs>